Greetings everyone! This, of course, is my recap video for the period of the early Aharonim, where I talk about the things I left out of the videos, correct mistakes that I made in the videos, and answer questions from Gaon and Navi level patrons on Patreon. As always, I offer a warm welcome to my newest viewers, the 2,000 or so that found me... somehow. I didn't do any collabs for this run, so I guess it was either on Al Mukadima's recommendation when he hit 100,000 subs, or just through the algorithm. Anyway, let's get to it! First of all, no. I do not have beef with John Green. This channel wouldn't exist without Crash Course History, and while I did take issue with some of the phrasing in his video on 17th century Eastern Europe, I remembered it being worse than it actually was. So here's what his words, as written by Bonnie Smith, were in the video. Candidates for king even had to commit themselves to religious pluralism, and that toleration drew Jewish people from Spanish and other intolerant regimes eastward into the kingdom. So this statement is technically correct in many ways, and I think it was largely simplified to fit into the context of the 17th century, but I also think it's misleading in a couple frustrating ways. Firstly, the main migration of Jews into Poland predated both the establishment of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth and the elected monarchy by two centuries. Secondly, although Sephardic Jews did begin to arrive in the Commonwealth in the 17th century, I think it's safe to say that no Jews in 1492 fled from Spain to Poland. However, you shouldn't take my criticism as a condemnation of the Green Empire as a whole. Everybody makes mistakes, which is why I make these videos. Now, when I fielded questions for this run of videos on Patreon, I initially forgot to put up the filter so only Gaon and Navi level patrons would be able to respond. So for one time only, Kibbutznik level patron Tom Galilad asks, was there a notable Ashkenazi Jewish presence in the Ottoman Empire? How did they interact with the Sephardic Jews living there? I feel like I've talked about this before, but the concept of Edda fit pretty neatly into the geographic nature of the Jewish legal system at the time. So up to the point I've reached in these videos, many Ashkenazi Jews had settled in the Ottoman Empire, and they'd settled in Sephardic Edot before. Uh, thousands of Ashkenazi Jews, of course, fled to Spain from the Holy Roman Empire during the Black Death. But having done that, and not being the majority in these jurisdictions, uh, the majority of Jews that is, they basically became Sephardic. If you're under the jurisdiction of a court that observes the Sephardic Minag, you're Sephardic, even if you were raised Ashkenazi. Rabbi Luria, his father was born in Germany, and that's why he's sometimes called the Ari Ashkenazi. Uh, Natan of Gaza was Natan Ashkenazi, his ancestors had come from Germany as well, but in practice, they were Sephardic. Uh, in fact, Ashkenazi is a pretty common Sephardic surname for exactly this reason. Now, by the late 17th century, the Jewish court system was starting to break down in a serious way, where Ashkenazi and Sephardic Jews were starting to migrate into each other's jurisdictions fairly often, but were now just setting up their own separate courts. We saw this in Amsterdam with Tzvi Ashkenazi and his congregation. Uh, the same thing was happening in London, and it was happening among the Sephardic community coming into Poland and Krakow. And around the time of the Ramchal, it was starting to happen in Jerusalem as well, which I'll discuss in a future episode. And this is why many countries today, including Israel, have two chief rabbis, one Sephardic and one Ashkenazi. And this isn't to say that you're either one or the other. There are many other Edot, like Italkim or Romaniot or Kochinim or Beta Yisrael, but they're a lot smaller and for the most part um, just kind of go along with everybody else. Now, Gaon level patron Matthew Brotman asks, Is Kabbalah still studied seriously today? Not that pop culture stuff, but for real. The short answer is yes, absolutely. But without knowing what led you to believe that it might not be practiced today, it's hard to know what to say about it without spoiling future episodes. While Moshe Hagiz definitively lost the battle to eradicate the Kabbalah, the fight over who could study it, or how much of a place it would have in everyday Jewish life, would continue for a couple more decades, and ultimately, it became primarily the domain of the ultra-Orthodox, especially Hasidim, 
who are only a small portion of the world's Jews today, which is maybe why you haven't heard about it. But I'll say right now that on election day in 2020, when the pandemic was just getting started, the Haredi party Shas was giving out amulets to protect against the virus, which is illegal. Uh, it's considered buying votes and they do it every time. But if ever there was a sign that the Kabbalah is alive and well, that's it. Now, a lot of Israelis will be surprised to hear that they only make up about 10% of my audience. Uh, about 40%, the largest share, are in the US. And accordingly, when I brought up the myth that Jews can't be buried in a Jewish cemetery as an example of an American minag, I got a lot of surprise responses. Uh, none of them from patrons, but in the name of promoting good information, I wanted to address it. All schools of Judaism, religious Judaism, as far as I'm aware, prohibit tattoos. However, and I'll be absolutely clear, the specific myth is that a body with a tattoo can't be buried in a Jewish cemetery. But to have a tattoo is only a ritual violation, and ritual violations don't stop Jews from being buried in Jewish cemeteries. Uh, most Jews aren't observant in the first place. It'd be like refusing to bury someone because they ate pork once. It, it, it doesn't make sense. And this is kind of what the Jews in London and Amsterdam figured out, that you don't need to be in compliance to be part of the community, uh, mostly. When you get into issues of marriage or conversion or heresy, uh, that's when you start getting into trouble. But like, Jewish courts aren't holding trials on heresy anymore, and in the US, which is our area of concern here, there just aren't. You know what? We'll talk more about the US in the future. I will say though that Although uh, it is frustratingly treated as fact, this myth is the basis for one of my favorite episodes of Curb Your Enthusiasm. So I have two corrections for this video. When Uriel da Costa arrived in Amsterdam in 1623, there actually was a second synagogue in the city. It was called Nave Shalom, and it was established in 1608 by the rabbi Yehuda Vega, but it was pretty obscure and it was subordinate to the Mahmad which is probably why I didn't come across it when I did the research for this episode. Second, in this video, I may have implied that France had no Jewish population in the decades prior to 1648. And that is technically untrue, but it was true in the eyes of the law and practicality. Starting in 1601, some Portuguese conversos ended up immigrating illegally into Southern France. This culminated in April of 1615, when the Regency of King Louis XIII forbid French citizens to shelter or converse with Jews under penalty of death. It didn't technically expel them out of France, but it did incentivize them to start looking for other places to go, which will become very relevant in a future video. Gaon-level patron Branch Ortiz asks, how did the Jewish communities of Europe react to the Protestant Reformation? And how did they react to the European wars of religion, especially the Thirty Years' War? I'm gonna guess that this question may have been inspired by a History Matters recent video on the Eastern Orthodox Church's response to the Reformation. So I'm gonna tackle this question in two parts. Now, the Catholic and Orthodox Churches both considered themselves to be the one true governing body for all of Christianity. So they had a vested interest, not just politically, but philosophically, in opposing the Protestants. Judaism, however, doesn't claim to be the one true religion. And since the Council of Yavne way back in the first century, Judaism has considered Christianity to be a totally separate religion. So Jewish authorities didn't have any particular stake in the Reformation beyond the practical consideration of how these Protestant movements might treat their Jewish neighbors. Martin Luther certainly expressed some very anti-Semitic views, and for what it's worth, the kingdoms that adopted Lutheranism as the state religion were also the last countries in Europe to have a Jewish population, other than Russia. Calvinism was more mixed. Uh, English Puritans in North America did not allow Jews to live among them, at least not initially. But Scotland and the Dutch Republic did. And Hamburg, which was a mix of Lutheran and Calvinist, invited Jewish settlement, much in the same way that the Dutch did. 
As to the European wars of religion, and specifically the Thirty Years' War, it was kind of the same thing. Now, Jews had been caught in the crossfire of the Hussite Wars. Uh, they were neutral and were attacked and killed by both sides. And the Jewish population of Bohemia after 1500 was basically an entirely new group of people who came in after. But in the Thirty Years' War, the overall impact on Jews was very minimal, which might sound impossible because this is a war that killed 10% of Europe's population. But you have to keep in mind where the war was being fought and where the Jews of Europe were living. Most of the world's Jews, let alone most of Europe's Jews, were living in Poland and the Ottoman Empire, which never got involved in the war at all. And most Jews in Western Europe at this time were either living in Italy, where the war never came, or the Netherlands, where the Dutch did fight, but mostly at sea, and they never had to fight on their own soil. As to the Holy Roman Empire, where there was significant overlap between the war and the Jewish population, you have to remember that this was a time when the vast majority of people, over 90% in the Holy Roman Empire, lived in rural areas, farming barely over subsistence level. This has two main implications. The first is that most of the fighting took place in rural areas because the distribution of population made those areas more strategic than they would be today. And the second is that those rural populations who lived off their own crops were particularly susceptible to the famine that the war, if not caused, greatly intensified. Meanwhile, virtually all Jews in the empire lived in cities, mostly in just a handful of cities, and mostly in places where the war never came. They didn't have to live off the land, they weren't allowed to serve in the army, and they were essentially living in an industrialized society before everyone else. Uh, this is why the Jewish population of Poland grew so quickly. To get from 350 people in 1350 to 185,000 in 1648, really, that's only just an annual growth rate of a little over 2%, which is what a lot of countries went through during the Industrial Revolution. So even as the Holy Roman Empire lost about a quarter of its overall population in the war, its Jewish population actually increased by about a quarter during the war. Now, this is not a correction or a question, but an elaboration. In this video, I basically put forth the ideas that Spinoza's philosophy was intrinsically linked to his Jewish heritage and that his ideas form the basis for the establishment of secular Judaism. However, it would be wrong to say that Spinoza himself was the first secular Jew. Spinoza didn't identify as Jewish after his chedah. The idea of someone not being religious but still being Jewish just was still alien at this time. This is the world he helped create. And his beliefs were iffy at best as to whether the Jewish people would even exist as a coherent culture without religious observance. I did make note in the episode of his statement in the Theological Political Treatise that religious orthodoxy was what was holding back the Jews from re-establishing a nation-state. But Stephen Nadler, whose book, uh, a book forged in hell, uh, was the main source for this video, thinks that this might have been meant sarcastically. Now today we can fully say that Spinoza was wrong. Nadler even noted that Spinoza greatly sugarcoated the fate of Spanish conversos who, even though they converted willingly and were rewarded for it, were also still treated as a separate class through the Inquisition for many generations. And he did this to reinforce his own point. But more important in my opinion is that Spinoza was quite young when he wrote the treatise, and he was also quite young when he died, so he never lived to see his own ideas play out which they did very quickly, like in a single generation. When all this business with David Nieto and Svi Ashkenazi happened, Spinoza would have been 72 years old. But he worked with glass and it got into his lungs, and here we are. So, a quick correction here. In this video, I put up a quote from the Talmud to the effect that Isaiah's prophecies of Hezekiah as Messiah were affirmed by Hillel the Elder. In fact, that quote is from the Gemara, not the Mishnah, so the Rabbi Hillel who said that was actually Hillel the Younger, the guy who fixed the Hebrew calendar. Incidentally, Isaiah was Hezekiah's cousin, as well as his father-in-law, so he had a reason to both have a lot of faith in him and to support him later on.
Now, people always want to know my sources, and I do put them in the end credits and in the descriptions. But in the comments for this video, I saw a lot of frustration from people who couldn't find primary sources for a lot of the things I said. And I want to address this because it highlights something that comes up a lot, not just for me, but for history YouTubers in general. My main source for this video was a book by Gail Shom Sholem called Shabtai Tzvi, The Mystical Messiah. The name of the book is the name of the video. Sholem was the foremost historian of the Kabbalah, and he's most people's main source on Shabtai Tzvi. But his book was originally written in Hebrew in the 1950s, using primary sources that were also in Hebrew and, one may presume, have never been translated. Even the book itself wasn't translated into English until the 1970s. This is a really common challenge to history YouTubers, uh, where most especially medieval and early modern sources have never been translated into English. M. Laser is probably the most famous person to highlight this because of the whole War of the Bucket issue, and uh, how the only reliable source on the subject was only in Italian and he had to translate it. He's done that for me on some Italian sources, and he's really doing God's work there, because there is so much out there that is just not accessible to most people in this field. And if you've been watching Genievlogger's series, Exploring My Family Tree, you know that many sources are not only untranslated, but handwritten, which is a whole other level of difficulty. Navi level patron Osher Gordon asks, with Jewish communities in Palestine and across the diaspora, was Hebrew evolving at the same pace across the globe? Would Lutzato's Hebrew in Venice have been the same as that spoken at the time in Palestine and other Jewish communities in the diaspora? Relatedly, is there something unique about how modern Hebrew has evolved since 1882 that is different from how the language had evolved prior to that time? Now, I'm starting what I hope will be a recurring series on the history of the Hebrew language. So I will try to keep this brief, and I will fail. Between the crisis of the third century and 1882, the Hebrew language had no native speakers. In the intervening centuries, it was maintained as the language of religion, of law, children learned it in school, so it enjoyed a status in the Jewish world not so different from Latin in Western Europe. A key difference, though, is that Latin evolved into the various Romance languages, so Classical Latin was upheld as the common prestige language. Hebrew never had to deal with that problem. It never had to distinguish itself from various colloquial offshoots. So the spoken form did develop different accents, and I touched on this quite a bit in my video on the Masoretic text. But the written form remained consistent across all geographic areas, while continuing to evolve grammatically, just not as quickly as so-called living languages. Now, what really distinguishes early modern Hebrew from medieval Hebrew is that when the Safed circle got going, the form of Hebrew that they were speaking began to evolve in parallel with changes that were going on in the local dialects of Arabic and Aramaic. Namely, that the entire system of verb tenses changed from perfect imperfect to past, present, future imperative. And at that time, most Hebrew publishing was happening in Constantinople, or Venice, or Amsterdam. But these publishing houses were but these publishing houses were printing manuscripts from all over the Jewish world, especially Safed. So when the language changed in Safed, those changes were immediately exported to the wider world. As for 1882, one of the reasons I started this channel was to fill the gaps in Jewish education that I felt gave an inadequate picture of Jewish history. And if you thought that was bad in Israel, it's even worse in North America. Because in North America, you were taught, I was taught, without hesitation, that the modern Hebrew language was created in the 1880s by a man named Eliezer ben Yehuda. Hardcore Marxist Yiddish activists of late love this narrative, because it has convinced them that modern Hebrew is an ahistorical imperialist conlay, and that Biblical Hebrew is the only true Semitic language of the Jewish people. Never mind that Biblical Hebrew is not a thing, and that's a story for another day. 
But I think I've already demonstrated pretty clearly that even if it wasn't being used as anyone's first language for such a long time, there was a continuity, and you can see this very clear evolution in Hebrew grammar and syntax and vocabulary. What Eliezer ben Yehuda actually did was that he created the first Hebrew dictionary. He expanded the vocabulary to incorporate many aspects of modern society. He established a standard conversational syntax that slightly differed from the literary form established by Mbluzzato. He established the Sephardic accent as the standard form because it had the small sound inventory and thus would be easier for people to learn. And in 1882, his son was born, Itamar ben Avi, who was the first native Hebrew speaker since the crisis of the third century. So to say that modern Hebrew is a fake language just because you don't know its history doesn't make it so. But at the same time, our educational tradition in the US and Canada encourages this idea that people like Herzl had in the same vein of like Petrarch that, oh, we're a new thing, we're totally new, what we're doing is totally unrelated to anything before, the past was bad and we need to forget it and we are so special. This approach was always dumb. It has outlived whatever usefulness it may have once had, and it only hurts us. So tune in next time when I do a little format experiment with the origins of Hebrew. And after that, I'm taking a break from the current timeline to explore some areas of Jewish history that I've sadly overlooked. Ever since the India video, everyone's been clamoring for more of these kinds of like side quest videos. and. I'm sorry I haven't gotten to any of them since then. I'm genuinely sorry. I've waited way too long to do this, and at this point we need to acknowledge... Special thanks to my patrons, including Eric Atreides, Jeremy Biskin, Osha Gordon, James Majors, Corey Ard, Matthew Brotman, Gary Davidson, Greg Maev, Brian Mechanic, Branch Ortiz, J.P. Strathausen, Navetal, Brian Tutin, Useful Charts, and Ole Weiss.